like to say good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's session. Uh, my name is Cathy Mitchell, I'm a councillor from Warrington and I'm also chair of TFN's scrutiny committee. Uh, this afternoon's session is Smart North, Integrated and Smart Travel Programme. Uh, before we get started, there's just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm. If the alarm does sound, go straight down the stairs outside this door and congregate on the cathedral forecourt, which is across the road. If you're using social media today, uh, could, if you're on Twitter, could you use the hashtag, hashtag One North? And TFN's Twitter handle is at transport for North with a number four. Okay, we've got three speakers today. Uh, I'll introduce them one by one. Our first speaker is Alistair Richards, who is the Director of Integrated and Smart Travel at Transport for the North. Could we welcome Alistair, please? Thanks, Cathy. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a, a good lunch and enjoyed this morning's session. Um, I'm the Integrated Smart Program Travel Director here at Transport for the North. It's my privilege to lead a team uh, that is working on the Integrated Smart Travel Program. But it, it, it isn't a technology program. Uh, it's about working with operators and authorities to deliver a customer proposition uh, that entices people back to public transport or even to try it for the first time. Uh, we spend a lot of our time analysing what are the things that are, are preventing people using public transport because sure as eggs are eggs, there, there is so much congestion on our roads at the moment that people aren't using their car because um, they think they're going to get a quick and easy journey. Um, they're using it because they just don't have confidence that they can uh, trust in the public transport. So we've got to try and make it easier, make it a more difficult decision for them to, to jump in the car and to actually find out better about uh, how that journey can be made by public transport. And that's what we're spending our time doing. Um, and that's across the, the spectrum uh, of, of age group. We're also spending a lot of time looking at what young people are looking for because more and more of them are not just automatically uh, rushing out and trying to pass their driving test as I did when I was a 17-year-old. Um, it's a much more considered decision now and if we give them good public transport then that is getting them in at the grassroots. That's encouraging them not to become hooked and dependent upon having a shiny piece of metal uh, depreciating on our, on our drives. So in 2018, we collaborated with um, what are effectively competing commercial rail operators to deliver interoperable ticketing for cu customers on the rail network across the north. And what we did was we achieved with those operators, we rolled out in three months across the north what has taken other parts of the country th in excess of three years to achieve. And, and the take-up we're seeing so far uh, is in excess of 30%, and it's taken, as I say, other parts of the country much longer than that to, to achieve that kind of take-up. And I think the reason behind that success for me is that we spent an awful lot of time um, listening to people, listening to customer focus, doing surveys, understanding what it was that customers actually want from uh, a smart system and how they want to interact. And, and it's about removing those barriers rather than actually saying, OK, you want smart, we're going to expect you to go online and request something and then you'll have to wait for it and then go to a train station to load product on. Um, we wanted to make it as seamless as normal. So people actually quite like when they're buying a season ticket, going up to their local uh, ticket office and speaking to somebody that they recognise, maybe they've always bought their weekly season ticket from someone, and to go there and just get it. And we've offered them the experience of just instead of having a paper ticket, just being given it on plastic smart card. What, what does that achieve, really? But in a way paper is is a problem because increasingly we put technology like gates and things on our stations which improve the security and the speed but not if you have so many devices on the gate that you don't know which slot or what thing to to put your ticket on 
So whereas with the smart card, it's quite clear, lots of people have been to London, they've experienced it, they just touch in and go through. Whereas the other supported methods of, of retail, they're just not that quick and efficient. So what does 2019 bring for us? Well, we need to extend uh, this collaborating across our deregulated bus operators. So taking that interoperability and that, that success we've achieved with our rail operator colleagues and um, continue that and expand our system into the multimodal space. Why do we need to do that? Well, <clears throat> to try and achieve that mission of, of getting people to realistically use public transport instead of their private car, we have to convince them that we're offering them a, a valid alternative. And that will mean several different modes, particularly if they're in a city and uh, making a connection between cities and then traveling around that, um, and that, that um, area. So um, we need to deliver a truly integrated customer offering. We need to make it far easier for people to find out about that journey before they set out. If we don't, they will not leave home without their car. If we don't make it straightforward for them to actually have the confidence that they are going to be able to make their journey, they are going to be able to just use a simple form of ticketing or preferably a form of payment, a trusted one, they will not, they will not leave their car at home. They will just go, I know I'm going to get stuck in a traffic jam, I know I'm going to find it difficult to find a parking space, but at least I've got some autonomy over my journey. If we improve the information before they make the journey, if we improve the information they get and receive during the journey, we stand much better chance of convincing them that it's a valid alternative to the car. Um, so it's about delivering confidence to customers that they won't be embarrassed. Um, I know lots of people that are just embarrassed about whether have you got enough money in your pocket for the journey that you're going to make. How many of us actually in the room have more than about one pound, two pounds in our pocket at any one time? I generally don't. I'm, I'm actually rattling today, which is unusual. Normally I leave home, I just have my contactless bank card in my pocket. I may have a 20 pound note in, in my wallet, but I do not normally carry um, cash. And I don't think I'm, I'm alone in that. Um, so we also want to be... Uh, sure that we're not going to be overcharged, that we're not going to pay more than we need to. Coming here this morning, uh, I met a colleague on the train and they said, I did a bit of research before I travelled, I bought a split ticket and I've got, got my journey for £40. Whereas if he'd just bought the ticket from A to B, it would have been £60. How gutted would he have been if he'd got on the train and I'd said to him, I bought a split ticket, I've got it a lot cheaper. We've got to give people the confidence that if they are wanting to pay the ticket, the, the price for their journey, they should be getting the right fare. They shouldn't, it shouldn't be a lottery of how much research they've done as to whether or not they're going to be charged a fair price for the journey they're making. We have to make that decision for them in the back office and we have to give them a trustworthy, uh, honest fare for the service that they are consuming. Equally though, our operators have to be absolutely confident that having put on, they've laid on the labour, they've laid on uh, the investment in the infrastructure to carry people, they have to be sure that they are actually going to get fair compensation for providing that service. So I think our ticketing system of the future we're investing in uh, on the behalf of the North has to be that almost a marketplace, really matching uh, customer demand to the providers of those services and making sure that that confidence, that trust. So it's almost the Amazon of the North is, is um, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, Im image I've got in my mind. Um, so more than ever before, I actually think uh, the conditions are now right. We've got consultations on fare simplification in rail. When we started the programme, we actually thought, no, that's too much to ask. If we make that a, a uh, prerequisite of starting the programme, we won't actually achieve what we're trying to set out to achieve. So we've actually built in the requirements to be able to cope with our existing complex fares model. But the more simplification that we can make and introduce as we're introducing this, the simpler it will be and the more chance that we can make sure that we absolutely give everybody the right, um, the right price 
for their travel that they consume. Um, but I'd like to return to the theme of partnerships and collaboration because uh, in many of the city regions we need to build on the mayoral visions and uh, the rail collaborations and we've got to work hard with our bus operators. It's a deregulated market, the bus market, outside of London. So London had it easy. They've, they've just in effect implemented their system with a flat fare across the whole of London. We can't, we can't do that. Liverpool has introduced a flat fare in their uh, city centre because the operators in Liverpool have agreed to do that. But we can't just roll that out across the north. We have to work with each of the different operators and cajole them, encourage them along with us on this journey. Um, but the customers deserve it. And I believe that the operators, if they do join in and collaborate with us and all the, the local authorities, I think with the combined volumes we'll be able to use, we'll actually be able to offer a, an economic solution to operators um, which will drive down their actual cost of retail. And that's important. It's got to add up for them. They listen to us when we say we think integrated travel will actually grow the market. But they turn around to us and say, can you prove it? Can you demonstrate it? And that's a very tricky one to demonstrate. What we can demonstrate, though, to them is if we can get the cost of retail down, then they can bank that, they can take that to their finance directors, they can take that to their board. So that's what we've concentrated on doing, is making sure that we're bringing volume to the system uh, and through that getting an economic solution for, for operators. And um, we expect then uh, customers um, to be able to just tap and consume the transport um, just as they do in a cafe or a bar or shops. Expecting our customers to actually go to a ticket machine, transfer their money onto a piece of paper or into a smart card and then go through a gate. That's just putting them through pain. No, no commercial model, uh, and we'll hear in a minute uh, uh, from small businesses, each of those businesses had to um, accept and, and cope with the new norm, which is expecting to be able to pay with a contactless bank card or a contactless phone emulation of the bank card. That is the new norm. Visa tell us that the number of uh, transactions have doubled year on year um, for the last few years. It's a, it's a hugely growing market. How many of us have actually gone into a taxi and said, do you take cards? And if they say no, it's like, or if you go into any kind of shop and retail and they don't accept contactless these days or bank cards, it's, it just switches you off as a consumer. It switches you off against that supplier. So more and more our operators have to, to do that. The big ones have already. The smaller ones up until now have at times kind of just gone, well, well we're not quite ready for that. That's too complicated. But Transport for the North is trying to support across the board, across the modes, across the operators, big, small, medium size and large. They all have to be able to take part in delivering the seamless journey for customers. If we don't, if we don't collaborate, if we don't deliver that, we are not going to get the people out of their cars. So the prize is worth the effort. For every motorist transferred, our cities and towns will be enhanced, the air will be cleaner uh, and Overall, it will be a better living experience. And that is what I passionately believe in. Uh, I want it to be a simple system. We're working hard to make it a simple system. We're working with suppliers who are really looking to make a new novel system uh, that delivers more for the North. Um, and uh, we, uh, we will transform that behavior, but we have to work together to achieve that, that change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair. Our next speaker is Aaron White, who's the Interim Head of, of Ticketing for the Rail De De Delivery Group. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so thank you for inviting me to the, uh, represent the Rail Delivery Group at the conference today. Um, for those of you who might not have heard of the Rail Delivery Group, uh, we bring together the companies that run Britain's Railway. Uh, so that's both passenger and freight as well as network rail. 
uh, with the aim of delivering a better railway for customers, uh, communities, the economy, and our people. When it comes to ticketing, it's the industry's back office system which provides the clearinghouse for the £10 billion in railway fares that people pay every year. So it's good to be here to talk about Transport for the North's ambitious plans to integrate public transport using smart ticketing across the North over the next four years and beyond, and how the Rail Delivery Group can support them with working uh, in that undertaking. At the Rail Delivery Group, we want more people to benefit from travelling by rail and in turn grow the rail industry. Now, in ticketing, uh, it's an environment that has more than two dozen train companies, um, more retailers than that, and it's on us to protect the standards by which tickets are designed, retailed, fulfilled, and settled. Beyond that, we have a remit to encourage passenger growth by making real travel easier, simpler, and smarter for the customers. So over the last year, for example, we have delivered on the Secretary of State's promise uh, on the availability of smart ticketing on, through the Smart Ticketing on National Rail Scheme, which has seen smart cards becoming available on uh, more than two dozen rail companies across the country. Or, sorry, a dozen rail companies across the country. Um, beyond that, the Rail Delivery Group has led on an award-winning scheme to deliver barcode ticketing, which is now enabled on more than 18 train companies, which has seen over 100 stations uh, uh, within the scheme and over 600 gates being upgraded. Now, through these two programs, uh, many customers now have the option to purchase their ticket digitally. In fact, barcode ticketing is proving extremely popular, and what we're finding from third-party retailers, where it is available to travel, uh, more than 90% of people are choosing it uh, as their method of fulfillment. Now, that's not because barcode is particularly new or innovative technology, but it's because you can download it to your smartphone, and people want to use their smartphone to travel. So these forms of ticketing also enable a better customer experience. In a previous role, I was the head of smart ticketing for a train company, and we had a smart card scheme on our system. Um, we introduced a, me a method of automatic compensation, which meant that anybody using a smart card, regardless of the ticket that they held on it, by tapping in and tapping out for their journey, we were able to provide them with a level of compensation if they were delayed, because we knew where they were traveling, we knew if they were delayed, we knew who they were, and we knew where to send the compensation to. So through our Future Connected Ticketing program, we investigate different ways um, of ticketing, traveling, and improving the end-to-end -end customer experience. So we can then spin up trials of some of these to assess the impact and potential benefits and determine whether or not there is merit in taking them forward across the industry. So over the last year, we have worked on how an interoperable, multimodal, pay-as-you-go ticketing scheme could work in Great Britain across the largest urban and suburban areas. There's also been some work done on account-based ticketing standards and the work that would be required to enable this form of ticketing. And in fact, both of these forms of ticketing are something that we'll see in Transport for the North. So if we want more people to benefit from rail and grow the industry, we should look at how we can change and improve. Now, I'm going to talk about a bit here, and it's been mentioned several times already, uh, but I think it's right to do so. And I think everybody in the room would agree whenever we say that buying the right fare can be complex and challenging. I myself have issued over 10,000 tickets personally, and I can tell you that sometimes I still get it wrong. So customers will find it very hard to be confident that they have the right fare for the journey, or where their plans change, that the structure is too rigid to accommodate this. And I know we say about the, the split ticketing and, and that that is an issue, but also the structure is very rigid and it doesn't reflect today's journeys. Fare regulations have remained largely the same since the 1990s and they don't reflect the changes to the way in which people buy tickets or use trains to travel. It assumed that most people wanted to buy their ticket from a ticket office because there weren't many other options back then, and the ticket structure reflected a world where commuters traveled five days a week from their home to a fixed office location. Today, there are many more ways to buy your ticket, and in the last 22 years, part-time working and self-employment have increased by over a third. So this is why, last year, the Real Delivery Group set out a desire to seek reform of these well-meaning but outdated regulations. So we ran a 12-week public consultation to which we received nearly 20,000 responses from members of the public, customers, businesses, and stakeholders. Now, the results of the, con the consultation are still being analyzed, and uh, we're developing proposals to reform fares regulation to make it easier for customers to get the right ticket, and supporting continued investment to improve the service. 
Now, I'm not going to provide any spoilers today, but this is an example of the industry delivering on a commitment to increase customer satisfaction by developing proposals for fares reform. Transport for the North's vision of delivering a fully inclusive public transport system, which will make it easier for its customers to travel seamlessly, using a type of ticket that they want, and be confident that they will always pay the best fare on the day, reflects what the Real Delivery Group want to achieve and is working on on a national level. There's no doubt that by delivering this, it will make public transport across the North more accessible, more connected, more transparent in terms of the price you pay and the information that you have, and therefore more efficient overall. We want to work with Transport for the North to help deliver this strategic plan, but we also want to learn from what Transport for the North are doing here in delivering their ambitious plans to integrate travel and transport on a scale that is nigh unprecedented. People have referred several times today to London and, and, and the services that you get in London. And there's no doubt that what London has is a, an incredibly successful scheme, which has a solid customer proposition at the heart. People know how much they're going to pay. It's a very transparent system. It covers many modes of travel. Um, and it caters just as well for commuters as it does for people that come in on a leisure basis. What people do forget sometimes is though is that it took TfL 20 years to get to that point, and there's a lot of work done in the meantime. And where Transport for the North are today are at the start of that process. And um, beyond that, Transport for London are a single operator working in a, over a single city across, and where they set the fares and they do the retailing for the, the, the journeys within their area. Whereas Transport for the North will be over several cities, larger area, and many different companies and the like, so it's a much more ambitious scheme. And I think it is now unprecedented anywhere in the world. So many of the aims for the Transport for the North Strategic Travel Plan are reflected in the work that the Real Delivery Group is also undertaking on behalf of the rest of the industry. But by working together, we can ensure that the customers and the communities are the ones that reap the benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you. I should, should say uh, it's always brilliant to be uh, in this building because just in that room now, I got married just over 20 years ago, so <laughs> it's always funny to be here. Uh, as I said, I'm from the Federation of Small Businesses. For those who don't know us, shame, shame. <coughs> uh, we've got 170,000 members across the UK, 30,000 in the North. We're the biggest single business organisation in the country because the vast, vast majority of businesses in this country are small. About 98, 99% are small and medium sized businesses. In the north, there's uh, about a million businesses employing just over 2,500 people. So it's really good, and I'm really glad that you've invited me to speak here because I think having the voice of small business is, is really important. Uh, what, what, what I say, I mean, uh, th th this issue is absolutely crucial to small businesses because there's a lot of talk today about some of the, the big strategic ideas, and these are really important for shaping the future and getting a successful economic. Uh, economy for the north so businesses can thrive here. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the thing that was going to make a big difference to small businesses and small business owners is being able to get to work on time, their staff being able to get to work on time, uh, being able to get to their customers, their customers being able to get to them. And that isn't going to be big shiny trains all the time. Sometimes it's, it's those very boring run-of-the-mill buses that, that go every day. And so anything that can make our buses more successful and our local uh, public transport, including the local trains, more successful is really important to small businesses, and I think often overlooked, really. Uh, and you know, and it's quite as well. You know, we've mentioned London. I mean, our trains and buses are worse than London, so it does make me wonder: does our technology also have to be worse than London? I mean, we have a real opportunity here to, to go ahead of, you know, rather than have a uh, smart ticketing system that is copying the Oyster system. Well, can we go somewhere? better than that? Can we do things smarter than that? I must admit, I was in London last week with an Oyster card, and it was interesting that I felt like cards are old-fashioned because most people don't use Oyster cards in London anymore if you're on the underground and things. So it's quite interesting how that's moving on as well. Uh, I think some of the reasons why this is really important is one of the things we're seeing in this part of the country, in, in the north, and in particular industries, is some real skills shortages developing. So anything that can help get... Uh, labour or, or you know, people to, to, to actually get into jobs, I think is really important. And, and often that will be 
through this sort of transport. I mean, I, I think at times, I mean, we don't quite know just how, you know, just how big some of these shortages are, but especially in things like engineering, there's some real severe shortages building up. Uh, and I think we don't often... I mean, I, I know in, in... I work across West Yorkshire. In the Leeds City region, there's a lot of talk about uh, areas of uh, persistent deprivation. So they look at, the, look at certain parts of, of Leeds, they put, you know, look at in, in, uh, 1900, 1950s, 1980s, and the same areas of, of, the, of the city uh, have you know, suffered from deprivation. And actually, a big thing is, is about getting people to where the work is, because there is a lot of unfilled posts at the minute. So how can we use it? And it's got to be... I mean, one thing I, I, I will say is we know that if buses are reliable, cheap, and easy to use, the usage will go up. This does address one of those three. I think the other thing that's really essential is we look at the prices of the buses, because a lot of the people who will be using them can't necessarily afford them. I mean, some of the bus prices, which, which are quite... I mean, we pay more for a bus in, in Yorkshire than we do in London, which, you know, one of the very few things we do pay, for, pay more for in this part of the world. So I think that, that needs to be looked at. I, I think, I mean, interesting hearing, hearing the other two speakers, I, I think the issue or the challenge of collaboration is, is, a, is a massive one. I, I know working for a membership organisation, trying to get small businesses to agree on anything is really difficult. Once you've got different competing interests, I think it's very easy. We can all say we, we have a shared goal, we want to work together, but wanting to work together and then working together are completely different things. So, so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that you're going to have to, have to face. And I think we should all be sort of aware of that. Uh, and, and I think one other thing I just want to say is that we, we do talk a lot about public transport, but I know Alistair mentioned it earlier. A lot of people still use cars. I mean, because that is, the, for them, they see the only, only way of getting around. And I, and I think we should always have in the back of our mind, remember that uh, for small businesses, roads are essential. And so we, we, we shouldn't pretend that that isn't the case. Now, it might not be where we want to be. We want, maybe we want to pe get people onto public transport. But we shouldn't ignore where we are now and think about how we're going to get people to where we want them to be or, or where we want business to be. And, and I think the, the other final sort of, sort of Thing that, that I think is going to be quite a challenge. I, th I think, as, as has been said, the North is very different to London. I mean, and I think there's some huge differences between, between the different parts of the North. In particular, I think some real urban and rural challenges. And I think things that might work in, in, the, in the cities in the North, I think what might struggle a bit in some of the, the, uh, the urban areas where, where public transport is very poor. So I think that's something that we need. But, but, but just, just it's finally, just to say, you know, the strategy that today is about is really important, but you have got to take people with you, and the way you're going to take people with you is by engaging with them where they are. For small businesses, this is some very practical day-to-day -day things. It is buses, it is local train uh, services. So this actually might not be the, the, the sexiest topic of, of the day, but actually in terms of engaging with small businesses and businesses in general and actually moving people on and actually getting people to buy into the strategy, I actually think this is the most important topic there is today. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. So, uh, could I ask the panellists to come and join me at the front so we can have some questions? Okay. So... The first thing is, how, how do you think better smart travel uh, will help local businesses? And this is perhaps one for Barney. I think anything that makes it easier to get on a bus, get on a train, a news train, has got to be a good thing. Because, I mean, I mean Alistair said before, you know, he, he, didn't, uh, he doesn't normally have money on him. I mean, I, I remember the days when you'd get on a bus and you'd be embarrassed because you had a fiver. Now, if you haven't got a fiver now, you can hardly afford to get on the bus, so you, you do need it. But you know, you've got to think about how people are using other services. And, and you know, I think I'm one of the last generations. I think people now in their 30s and 20s, you know, they are largely cashless. And I think buses and trains have got to recognise that they... I mean, I know it's a different type of market they operate in, but, you know, they're... they're these are our customers, you know, these are the people. And so that they've got to actually be able to offer them a service that they want that is actually what they expect, what, what was in keeping with the rest of their lives. I mean, 
And, and so I, I think this, you know, if we... And what, what is also is really important is I think this is a move towards making buses more accessible. And we do need to get more people on the buses because we, we I think we're, we're at the point where we're facing a, a, a real big issue with buses that a lot of decision makers are overlooking, I think. And, and I know it, as a local councillor, you all sort of have a lot of pressures on, on funding. I, I think a lot of the austerity has been loaded onto people two steps down, and, and the people making decisions sort of forget about it and don't take responsibility for some major issues that are affecting our economy. If, if I can come in as well, I mean, I think local businesses are both those in, in the retail sector, but also we have an awful lot of small um, bus operators, local businesses that have kind of handed them down through generations or, or uh, startups. And um, I think for some while they've been, a, they've kind of almost taken a, 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 a just a, or we don't need to face it right now, but I think increasingly for them to continue to compete, they have to interact with customers in the, in the currency that customers want to interact with them. And the big groups have invested in contactless technology. So I think customers now have an expectation that when they get on a bus, they can just interact with, with their bank uh, payment card. Um, and I think those small businesses have to keep pace. Um, and we are very keen on supporting them uh, along with all of the businesses to make sure that they all have a, a fair opportunity to, to, to deliver their services, to apply their trade, um, because they deliver uh, an essential service in, in a lot, lot of our areas. And on those less economic routes, the, the bigger, bigger players won't support. So I think it's important that we, we work together, we collaborate, and we find a way of allowing them to continue to, to compete um, on a fair playing field with, with the bigger operators. Yeah, um, so I mean, I'm the, the, the expert on rail and specifically fares and ticketing, but if I would go for a sort of a wider transport um, view on this, and you're looking at small businesses just outside of the transport sector, but the small businesses that you'll find across the, the north, um, one of the aims of the strategic travel plan is to by making uh, the fare simpler, by making ticketing easier, by making, it more, by making the information the passengers have more accessible and making that journey seamless, you give the customers uh, more confidence in the journeys that they're making. What you're really then doing is creating an economic environment within the north that will make it easier for small businesses to operate and will, that will allow them to flourish. You're creating those connections with the rest of the, internally but also with the rest of the country as well. So I think this, this strategic plan over the next four and 30 years into the future will just create that environment that will allow small businesses to grow. Because for one, one, thing, sure. one thing I think is really unusual about buses is it's one of the very few places where you're gonna, you step on a bus and you won't actually know for sure, and if you don't use that bus all the time, what you're paying. And how many other financial transactions do you go through where you don't know what you're doing? And I'd, I'd say probably in a pub is the only other one I can think of. But it's very odd, isn't it, that you step on a bus and you're not expected to, you know, you don't know what you're going to pay before you step on the bus. I, I would actually take that. In, 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 even when it comes to London, I'll be honest, I travel by bus in London every day. I couldn't tell you what I pay either. I just know that it'll be the right amount. And it's having that confidence. It's not yeah. the amount that you pay. It's that you have the confidence that it'll be the right amount at the end of the day, I think is the thing. Yeah. So do you think a better integrated and smart travel system would open up greater opportunities for jobs for the next generation? Barney, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of touched on that. I think there are... There are Areas of whether we're kind of stubborn deprivation or, or however we, we want to talk about th these areas. I mean, the great areas in, in, in a great part of the world is what, how we probably should talk about them. But actually, helping people to, to physically be able to get into where the work is and not just be able to physically get there, but afford to get there. Because a lot of the jobs, especially for younger people, aren't the best paid jobs. Uh, yeah, and if, if you're on a not much more than minimum wage job, then actually y your transport is, is a huge sum of money. And so we're pricing people out of jobs, really, aren't we? And, and so we've got to make it easy, and, and, and not just you know, affordable, but easy for people to get to where the jobs are, because there are significant skills shortages building up. Uh, and one of the ways to solve it is to get, to get people out there into these vacancies, because there are people with those skills there, it's just matching them up. I, th I think a lot of our local authorities are very conscious of this. And a lot of them are pushing um, the uh, 16 to 18, meaning the day before the 19th um, birthday. And, and that's absolutely essential, I think, because um, 
you know, people are expected to continue to in education right up until then. And, and your point that um, essentially the wages that they're likely to get at those kind of ages, they're not able to pay full fare. So I think that's an absolutely essential one. I think it's difficult because authorities, as, as you know, are competing, particularly with that revenue funding and what, what they can afford to fund. But we have to prioritise that. It's essential because if we, we, if we develop the young people, they get those jobs, they'll, they will stay in the area, particularly if we create the same kind of environment um, that they would get. Up until now, it's been a case of you having to go to London because you think mm. it's all happening there. Whereas I think incre increasingly in, in the North cities, there's a vibrancy, there's a, an excitement, there's interest. The, the, the way of life is getting better. So if we invest in, in our young people, we give them that experience here, I think they will stay and they'll continue then to reinvest and the North will grow. It's essential. Yeah, um, I mean, I echo all of that. I mean, if the only thing I would add on, on top of it is that I think it, this, the work that Real Delivery Group are doing and, and uh, Transport for the North are doing, it should help to create a fair structure that will be more reflective of the way in which people work. Because um, the way in which we work today will not be the way necessarily that our children or our children's children will, will work, and that's sort of the time frame that we're looking at whenever we're talking about the strategic plan. So, um, you know, there, there may be more flexible working, there may be more working from home, it, it may be something that we can't even conceive of uh, now, but the fair structure that we create now and the, the systems that are set up need to be agile enough to be able to reflect that in the future. And, and from what I've seen, they will be, and so, you know, again, it's all about the, the, this first step on a, a longer journey to create that, that environment that will help these things to, to work. Okay. Do you think enough is being done to support integrated and smart travel? <laughs> um, we, we've been very ben, uh, beneficial from uh, the investment that George Osborne pioneered some years ago. Um, it's been uh, a long struggle to create the business cases, um, but at least we've known that we've been going for a ring fence pot of money. Um, we've not had to compete, and I think that was the theme of one of the earlier sessions, is that it's been often difficult for us to compete on a level playing field for funding um, with other regions, particularly the South, um, because of the way that the uh, appraisal scheme works. Um, but we have found that if we get our numbers right, if we, if we get the scheme right, we are able to compete. And we have, working closely with uh, colleagues in uh, Rail Delivery Group and in the Department for Transport, um, we are able to take schemes to central government and actually win that, win that funding and invest it. Um, I think what we're also doing is making sure that we're monitoring the benefits we're achieving because otherwise there's a danger that we just spend the money and we think, well, okay, we, we've put smart ticketing in without really checking that we've actually achieved the, the change, the transformation that, that we were seeking to achieve. Because it's not, it's not one size fits all. It's about making sure that what we do, we then tweak to make sure it really delivers the value. And um, so I think I wouldn't complain about, we, we're lucky in the funding we've got, um, but it's about absolutely making sure that we make best value out of that with our partners. Okay. Yes, okay. So I think I mean, over the last several years, um, we've seen, say, the, the introduction of the smart card on various train companies across the country, and I'm sort of talking more nationally here, and the, the barcode scheme as well that I, I refer to, and those are starts starting down the road of a digital ticketing. Um, there are trials, um, there was a trial over in the Great Western area, there's a trial up in Scotland on the way at the minute to do, looking at um, putting tickets onto smartphones um, using a particular standard. There are pay-as-you-go schemes in place on National Rail, and there are account based ticketing trials that are happening. So there's lots of work being done to enable smart ticketing. Um, what, what we, what, the next step beyond that will be the, the, sort of the, the information and the benefits you get from that. There are lots of suppliers and companies out there that are tr using that information, that sort of open data, to, to try and then provide a better level of customer service for the end-to-end for the -end journey. So th there's been some work done. I think there's a lot more work to do. Um, I think with the, um, the, the advent of both the Williams Review and the Fair Reform consultation underway, we have almost a, a perfect storm of opportunity to create a system that will, will, will help deliver the rest of the smart ticketing. I'm, that's quite selfish in my view, uh, my part, because that's where I work, but the smart ticketing side of things uh, for, for the benefit of the customer, 
on a national level? I think uh, the, the answer to the question is, I think st things are being done now, but obviously, historically, not enough has been done. Uh, and I think that, you know, I mean, the Federation of Small Businesses, along with most other business groups, were called for Transport for the North. You know, we're delighted that it, that it is here, because this is <coughs> why we need it. Because you know, if civil servants uh, make, who have make, made decisions in the past had to go on the transport we went on, and their kids and their wives and husbands and everyone else, use the transport we've had to use, I think they would have done something about it sooner. Uh, uh, I'll just say as well, I think the open data is really interesting as well, because I think that there's a real uh, chance now you know, for entrepreneurs to get to use some of this information to create some really smart ways around some of the problems that, and solutions we've not even thought about yet at all. Yet. You know, that there'll be new solutions out there, and the more you can make these things open and accessible, the greater chance we have of all benefiting from them. How do you envisage innovation in integrated and smart travel over the coming years? Okay, so <laughs> we're getting into the, the, the theoretical side of things. I mean, we, we, we have done, I mean, there's been a lot of focus on the, the rail and, and, and the bus, um, but I mean, often it's used as a term, but mobility as a service or the end-to-end -end journey, it's, it's about the whole of the, of the journey. It's about using your, your, your phone or the device that you want to use to purchase an entire journey, carry it in the way you want to carry it, use it in the way you want to use it. Um, the information that you get on the journey, the rerouting, um, if something's going wrong, the, the compensation being given that automatically, but everybody having a customer experience that regardless of who they buy their tickets from or who they're traveling with, that they have an experience which is, is roughly the same. Um, there are many companies out there that are sort of innovating the, using this information to, to try and improve that level of customer service. Um, I mean, it's as broad as it is wide. It, sorry, my thing keeps slipping off here. But um, it is. There we go. Um, it, <coughs> it is as broad as it is wide. Um, I, I, I think in, in five, ten years, and certainly by the end of this strategic plan, we won't recognize um, the, the way in which people are traveling. It will be, be so transformed. Um, and I, I, want, I would like to see a sort of an environment whereby you don't even necessarily have to worry about anything. You sort of you leave the house, you get into the taxi, you get to wherever it is, the autonomous vehicle that gets you to the station. When you get to the station, you walk through and you get onto your train. And when you get off your train at the other end, you get onto a bike. But at no point do you necessarily have to tell somebody where you are and what you've done. But you, you get charged the right amount for the entire journey. Maybe in, in, 20, in 10, 20, 30 years' time, that's absolutely possible, just because the system knows the system, but the system knows from the device that you're holding or the wearable that you have, where you're travelling and what you're doing. But that's some quite, quite ways somewhere in the future. I, th I think there's, <clears throat> we, we can all kind of uh, extrapolate about whether it's going to be biometrics or however we interact with the system. Um, but I think the thing for me that um, if we get it right, it will reap benefits for us is, is the data, your point about the open data. Um, I think in, in my lifetime I've seen that almost that the amount of data has just almost exponentially grown each, each year. Um, but whether we've actually <coughs> used that data as information to actually improve everything that we're doing, I, I think that's where we've missed something so far. And my, my desire is obviously to make it far easier um, for customers to interact with the system and pay a fair price for the transport, the service they're taking. But really, it should be more than that. It, the data that we're collecting, so, I mean, that's, that's the basic, that's the basic job. Um, but the data we're collecting, we need to really use that so uh, to help understand how a transport plan really is working and whether we are getting the best value out of the services that we are operators are providing, um, whether they are offering the right kind of range of products which are encouraging what the behaviours we want to, to encourage. So for me, it's, it's probably less about the technology. It's more about making sure that uh, with this improving, increasing amount of data and knowledge we have about people, that we use that and almost reinvest that knowledge to improve the overall transport experience and the, the welfare of the North. I mean, uh, the, the other thing I think that I think is fascinating, I and mean, we're already there, but I'm sure we're going to get a lot better, is any of us could be plonked down in any town in, this con in the country and actually we'd be able to throw off smartphones, we'd be able to work out how to get somewhere. And, and that's astonishing. To, you, know, you don't need the local knowledge you needed 20, 30 years ago. And I think the second thing is jetpacks. We're getting them, aren't we? Is that in the strategy? Yeah? No? Maybe. Maybe at the end of it, I think. I don't, th I don't think that made the cut. <laughs> 
Okay, um, I'm going to throw the questions out to the audience. Does anybody have a question? This lady here. Hi. Um, just thinking about the deliverability of it, I guess, uh, probably to Alistair or you know any of you, not to blindness with science, but how does it work in terms of Obviously, you've got different operators across the system, bus operators, train operators, network rail, not known for talking to each other particularly efficiently. How would an integrated smart travel system work? Who would have ownership of it? Are you expecting all of them to talk together and say, you know, this card or this phone can now be used across all these systems, or would you manage it as a TFN? Um, I think, I think we, we play an important part in getting the system up and running. Um, I think we play an important part acting as a counsellor, as a, as a relationship manager, if you like. And I think that's one of the most important roles that we can play um, and have to play. Um, operators have the best understanding of customers. We don't, I don't think. That's their expertise. But they're not necessarily, they're, they are competing animals. So we have to find a way of making them work together. In terms of the ownership, I think it's absolutely um, public sectors has to get that thing going. But after it's going, it's absolutely essential that operators feel they own the system and then help develop it. Um, otherwise, we don't have a valid model. I mean, public sector is increasingly uh, restricted on its revenue funding, so we can't, we can't continue to support it. We have, to, we have to give it life. We have to make sure that it's got... Um, uh, it grows up, it develops that volume, but then we have to encourage the operators to take that ownership and then continue to develop it. Um, and that is, is quite a challenge, but it's also exciting. It's, um, it's a bit like a, a local ownership model, if you like, and um, particularly if we can get the small and medium-sized operators in that model as well, um, then it, it, it'll be really, really ex exciting and successful. Can I just um, add on to that as well? I mean, uh, that, so that's in the Transport for the North area. But, and, and you're right, I mean, it can get quite technical. And the number of conversations that Alistair and I have had and have been in the room together where those technical conversations happen are quite, um, quite, quite long. Um, so uh, what Transport for the North are doing are, are developing this system and getting that ownership from the people that are inside it. And what we need to do from a real delivery group point of view is make sure that that then works and aligns with the systems that we, that we're, that we have as well. So if you look at, uh, for example, uh, sort of work, again, London, Transport for London, they have this, this fantastic um, operating system within uh, their area. But if you want to try and put a smart ticketing system into that, it's, it's incredibly difficult to do so. Um, and, and they become a bit of a, a walled garden. And so a lot of the smart ticketing schemes work up to London and then just sort of abru abruptly start. And if you want to travel through London, you've got to do something else completely to try and cross it. So if that was to happen for Transport for the North, that would be quite challenging because if you come to, to, to sort of Sheffield and stop and then have to do something, then choose, do something else whenever you get to Scotland, that would be quite a, a customer challenge. So um, we, we try and work closely with Alistair and Alistair's team to make sure that what they're delivering, what they're building, will be able to integrate with what we're building and that we're working together to sort of align those systems so we don't uh, run into that problem down the line. Okay, guys, can I, say, I think one other role that Transport for the North has that you didn't mention is when you do get these problems, because it's going to be so hard to do, it's not the consumer who has to who, who so bears so. the brunt of it, because it always is, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Next question, please. Hi. <coughs> yeah. um, I'm of an age when I can have a bus pass and I can have a senior citizen's rail card. But that said, I find some of the fares just simply eye-watering to this day. And I wondered if smart travel, smart ticketing could perhaps take out some of the ripple from the system for, for any one journey you might find if you go on a Sunday at this time, it's £200. If you go on a Tuesday at this time, it's £20. I, I, it's, it's bonk, and I'm, it discourages people big time from mm -hmm. using public transport. If you, it, one, one of your speakers there said they didn't know how much they're going to have to pay when they get on the bus. Uh, I go to the ends of the earth before I undertake a rail journey just to make sure I can even half mm -hmm. afford it. Would, tra would smart travel take out some of the ripples? <clears throat> I think... I think that part of that information uh, that I was talking about earlier in our phase two is looking at making sure that we're giving people as much information as we can. Um, we aren't the fare setter. It's either the 
um, there's either nationally on the rail or um, each local operator sets their fares. So, um, and we have to be very careful not to interfere in the market. Um, but what we can do is we can encourage them to be as transparent as we can. Uh, we can make sure that the customer doesn't have to work out which thing. We can code those rules into the back office. But we can't and we shouldn't um, actually interfere in the commercial market, not in the current climate. That's for politicians and others to, to decide. Um, I have my own personal views, but that I, that's not appropriate for me to, to, to add um, at this point. But uh, what we mustn't do is make sure that that becomes a barrier. Uh, Obviously, people need to be able to understand uh, your point. What other place do you go where you don't actually know how much it's going to cut, charge you before you, you travel? You have to have at least, um, and we think, a day cap, a limit, which you know that you will not spend more than that. And that's fair, I think, because when I go to London, so long as I look on my bank statement, I don't go, is it 6.50, is it 7.50, or is it 5.50? I just know that so long as it's not more than what I have as the day cap in my mind, I haven't been overcharged. I, I know I've, I've had a fair deal. And I think we've got to keep it at that le level. We've got to make sure that people understand that uh, in, in a certain area, we, we're looking at the former PTE regions around the city centres where people already understand where the boundaries are. They've kind of emerged over time um, that, that there should be a capped there's no more than a certain amount that you'll charge for no matter how many times you tap in that area. And we think that will really grow the market. We think that will give the confidence to, to the consumer um, and also a fair, fair amount of money for the operators. Um, I, think, I think you make a, an important point about the cost of travel, um, but we'll leave that to the politicians, or I, I will anyway. Thank you. No, I think that, sorry, I think that is right. It's the, there's the two different points. There's the first structure and the fair cost. Um, and so the, the, the first reform consultation that we undertook last year is sort of a step to try and reduce that. It is, I mean, you, you go to Sheffield Station today and you can buy a ticket to any other real station in the country, and that's the case for every other real station in the country, and it becomes hideously complex to do so. Then you have peak and off-peak and super off-peak and advanced fares and super advanced fares, all, to, all catered to two different markets, and it's quite, very, it's quite tough, it's incredibly tough to know that you've got the best deal. So simplifying that structure, um, and certainly where you have a an area like Transport for the North, there's the opportunity to do that. And as I say, again, with the Williams Review and the Fairs Reform piece of work, there is the opportunity to make it easier for people to understand what the cost of the journey is. The cost of the journey, however, as Asa says, is not something that I could really go into. Okay. This <coughs> gentleman here, please. Hi, Tony Mars from Modern Railways and from Manchester. And I, I can just tell you, by the way, in the West Midlands, they tell you your fares on the bus stops. I was back down there at home a few weeks ago, so, and I was able to get the, get the cash out of my pocket. To pay. <laughs> <coughs> so two, two questions uh, in, in one for, for the, 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 the PTE type thing. Um, I was talking to Tra Transport for West Midlands about this. They said the biggest problem is that you've got transport modes on completely different financial structures, and harmonising this is the hardest thing. In my house in Manchester, I can go and get a train in one direction, a tram in another, and there's a bus in between, and one's deregulated, one's highly regulated, and one has to virtually cover its costs. So that, I would guess, is the biggest challenge for you, is, is how you can put a cap on something where each one of them has promised their shareholders or their stakeholders different amounts of revenue. And for the, I'll be polite, I won't call you the Red Apology Group today. Relative <laughs> group. I, Thank you. I, I keep hearing this, this, this talk about this utopian thing where I, I, my meeting overran, so I just pressed my app and it moved my ticket to a, a train an hour later. And, and this is the thing, you move that ticket from an off-peak ticket to a peak ticket. If it moved your, your ticket at the same price, you destroy the revenue of the train company. If you add £100 on, because it's a peak fare, you've destroyed the revenue of the person who owns the ticket. And that, that seems to be the hardest thing. You said you, know, you could just wander from one form of transport to another and be confident you'd paid the right fare. And that is, In the future. Yes. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest challenge is going to be we've, we've got the best yield management system on railways in the world, which is why the French are copying it. The Irish have introduced it a year ago. And yield management doesn't work with just wandering onto the first train that comes and pressing an app, does it? It, well, it, it's about the, if you knew in advance how much your journey was, and then you could make the decision whether or not you get that chain or maybe the next chain. Maybe those two different chains do have different prices, but you have the information in, in advance, and you can make that decision, then, then, then fair enough. Um, 
so I mean, earlier today we, we, we heard from um, Andrew Jones and also the, Se the Shadow Secretary of State, Andy MacDonald, as well, and, and they both said roughly similar things in that they want the fair system to be, more, to be simpler uh, and, and less complex. Um, and as, as Alistair has alluded to, the, the, how that works with the cost and what have you, that is a political decision that will have to be, be taken. So it's not something that we can answer here but it's not beyond the wit to, 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 de to develop something which delivers that. There's a lot of work going on um, in the last six months within the Real Delivery Group to come up with the proposals for what that could potentially look like and then how that, that would then work and then we'll present that and see which, uh, which one wins out in the end. I, th I think we're very lucky <coughs> we're in Sheffield today um, and I think Sheffield is a leading light just as the West Midlands are in multi-operator ticketing. Um, I think here in Sheffield there's a product called the uh, South Yorkshire Travel Master, um, and it's a ticketing company product, and it's multi-operator, and it's the prices are set at an attractive rate, um, so it's got a very high uptake amongst the, the population, um, and so it works. So setting a daily cap here in uh, South Yorkshire in the area around Sheffield, a uh, piece of cake. Uh, and in a sense, the apportionment of those revenues, it's all covered by the ticketing agreement that already exists, um, so that's great. So we've tried to target those areas. Some areas are not as advanced as others in that. Um, West Yorkshire as well, the, the M card product, um, already set of rules, existing customer base, and, and, it, and it works um, similarly in, in the northeast. So we've, we've tried to work with different areas. West, uh, the West Midlands have got a very good, good product and with the flat fare, very similar to, to the Liverpool, Merseyside uh, situation. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to induce the technology, we're trying to use um, existing technology, not asking operators to invest in uh, light years ahead, uh, making sure it's on a common platform and making sure that we're not trying to reinvent everything all in one. Um, so working with those ticketing companies, those existing schemes and really just coding the rules in the back office and then we expect we'll be able to give more data to those ticketing companies then they'll develop their products over time and it'll take, it'll take it, an evolution to actually deliver exactly what we want to achieve. But I do abs I absolutely think it's deliverable because of the way we're targeting those areas which already have those, those scheme rules that we're going to code in. Sorry? Um, uh, no, I think, I think evolution. I think revolution's a bit too, too dramatic, um, but definitely transformation. So, uh. okay. I need to get my glasses to here. See you. Hello there, my name's Carl Jessup. I work for NHS England and I um, work on a panel of patients who travel across South Yorkshire and Bassett Law to access treatment. Um, and I attended a meeting with them a while back and, and um, they do travel across town so they'll access treatment in Sheffield while living in Rotherham or quite often quite rural areas of our patch, Bassett Law, you know, the um, workshop, that area. Um, and I think they would welcome a kind of a, a more seamless ticketing system but I must admit it's not on anybody's top list of priorities, you know, in terms of faith in kind of being able to get to their appointment if it's an early one on time you know you're building in time to miss a kind of a, a connecting tr uh, bus or a bus to train connection um, and you know what is a, an half an hour appointment might take more or less half a day up um, for the most unfortunate patients and you have to do it more than once a week sometimes and yeah. um, so i wonder if um our focus on this is, is, is if you're trying to build people's kind of um, faith in public transport, specifically buses, because they're the people, you know, the people I'm talking about access buses more than anything, even though they could probably get a train that they can't afford from, you know, workshop to, to Sheffield. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, it's not much, much of a question, it's more of a point, really. Um, but also, I think you mentioned about. Um, <coughs> You, you, I think you, you yourself, Aaron, and sorry, I can't remember your name. You, you talked about kind of having faith that you're going to get charged the right amount. You know, you use your card and what have you, and you, it might be six oh, quid, it might yeah. be seven quid. But I have to sort of say, the people I'm representing today, these patients, they're, they're not in that. A pound here and there isn't 
negligible to mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. um, so um, just a point, that's all. But yeah. welcome to the discussion. Thanks very much. I, th I think you're right. It's, um, uh, ticketing isn't, isn't a solution to, to, to everybody's, uh, and even information, if there isn't an alternative to go and use. Um, that doesn't that doesn't solve that problem. Fundamentally, good public transport is essential, and then these things make make a difference on top of that. Uh, Chris from Lincolnshire, and I represent a rural part, and I mean seriously rural. When I go to a council meeting, it's a 108 mile round trip, and if I want to go by bus, I've got to have bed and breakfast in Boston overnight. But what I want to really put to you all is, we have. I'm lucky my bus pass. My bus pass in Lincolnshire, we have them 24-7 round the clock. Aren't we lucky? And don't the people of Norfolk envy me when I'm using it? But what I really want to say is, those of Lincolnshire, and I'm so flattered they wanted me to represent them on Transport for the North because of my enthusiasm, but this is a unique opportunity we have to me, and I welcome your views, a unique opportunity to show how people of disparate views from disparate parts of a substantial part of this country can work together in the way they already do in Germany, the Netherlands, and Scandinavia. This ought to be, Transport for the North and our plan ought to be the way this has been done for the last century, and we're going to get one go at it. And looking up there, I've got to say congratulations to whoever suggested that FSB be involved, because the economy of this country has been run, is being run, and will always be run by SBs. Because if all the SBs, if, well, if 20% of them added one person, we'd create two million jobs. And it seems to me that it's everybody working together for the same end. And do you feel that this could be a model as to how we do this around the country instead of faffing around like we are now? My last point is, Chester last Thursday, first fare I was quoted was 106 quid, but I understand the fare system, I got it for 34. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, think it, I think it has to be a model. Um, I think we haven't got everything right. Um, but the thing that's impressed me since being with Transport for the North is that um, everyone pulls together to deliver. Uh, we have some difficult dis uh, conversations behind closed doors, but everyone then joins together because uh, they recognise that united we will achieve so much more and and i think that has to be the way i think i heard andy burnham in this morning session at the end um, saying he wished um, that when he'd been in in, in parliament he'd realized that had he worked um, more effectively with his colleagues um, then he could have got a lot more leveraged for the north and um, i thought that was incredibly honest of him and I actually like to think that part of that realisation is from his work with Transport for the North and working with other leaders uh, and seeing what they've been able to achieve in a united, and um, I think we're very fortunate. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I've noticed, I mean, I, I've come up from, um, well, Norfolk today, and uh, one thing I've noticed is so many different councillors from so many different uh, county councils across the entire area, and everybody seems to be pointing in the same direction. The, the opportunity that Transport for the North has to develop transport in, in the north of this country, as I said, is, is nigh on un, unprecedented. And um, it's going to take some time, and there will be some difficult discussions to be had, and, and it's not going to be a big bang overnight, but um, at the end of it, it should have a revolutionary, evolutionary or transformative transport system in, within the north that I think everybody would be able to be proud of. And it's just, I think it shows from the attendance today, from the wide range of businesses and councils and, uh, and other stakeholders, uh, how important that is, and that everybody is willing to make it work. Thank you. It's been a very interesting day so far. Um, it will be great if we can reduce the complexity of making public transport journeys. I've got a journey down to London. I'm going to take my elderly person's rail card, my senior citizen rail card, the ticket, the uh, fare reservation and then I'm going to have to buy a ticket on the underground at the end and then I'm going to have a ticket and a seat reservation on the way back. Um, simplifying that ought to be possible. Yeah. Yeah. But the point I was wanting to, to make is that public transport's competing mainly with private cars. And for the private car driver, the inveterate private car driver, they have to make a decision about whether they're going to get on board 
with whatever smart ticketing system is adopted. And if they can have something which doesn't offer that barrier, like being able to use their um, bank card, or use a system which pays for their parking or something like that, then that will get away from that transition that car drivers have to make in deciding to use public transport, as well as providing the information that they need to know before they make it. Is that part of the plan for the way that the smart ticketing is going to be introduced in the north? I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's about... It's about avoiding having to print out or use a, a form of payment to then convert into something else and then having to have some other evidence to prove that you're paying the right, right price. Um, that's just, it's just almost ludicrous in, in this day and age um, to, to go through that complexity. No other, uh, no other form of consumerism actually expects the customer to go through that much pain. Um, so why should we as, as transport um, operators and, and providers expect our customers to do that? So absolutely. Um, I think by putting the rules and the intelligence in the back office and then just allowing the interaction with things, um, I mean, I don't think uh, we'll expect just to tap and go for everything because people need to know what price they've gone for the bigger value journeys. And so it's, it's about appropriate, appropriate technology. But absolutely, I think that it should be that one, that one card proving who you are or however you're interacting with the system, proving that you're the person that bought an advance ticket at £30 um, because you've shopped around. Um, plus then when you're travelling in a certain defined area, you're then just trusting that you're tapping and going and won't be charged more than the, the, than the day cap. I think it's that kind of model that we're, we're looking to achieve and implement, and I think that will improve, um, improve that simplicity uh, for, for, for travelling public. I mean, do, I'm now going to do a horrible thing and simplify your argument to try and make my own point, and I apologise in advance. But yeah, I don't think it's as much... I, I, just so, I don't think it is necessarily private cars versus public transport. I think it is all part of the same thing, and it's not... You know, and part of an integrated transport system is, is how people use their cars, but hopefully use it less. But for small businesses, car use is the number one, and vans is the number one way they get around. If you can get people to run their businesses more efficiently by leaving their cars at home, then tell them, because you'll make a fortune. Um, so I, I, I commute to London on a daily basis, and I have my ticket on a smart card. Um, but because it's a season ticket, I need to have a photograph, which means I've got a piece of paper to validate the piece of plastic that I use for travel, which does make a, a mockery of it. But I have to have that piece of paper because of the, the ticket that I've got. And one of, whenever you're talking about national rail or, or even public transport in general, um, th there is a very wide range of customer types. Um, so where you're looking, again, at London, and people say, well, what London have is fantastic. Why can't we just roll it out across the entire country? So, well, that, that works up to a degree, but it doesn't work for children aged five because they don't tend to have bank cards, but you need to have a, 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 something to travel. Um, you know, for, if you have a real card, it doesn't provide a real card discount. It doesn't work for advanced purchase or first class. Or uh, there are a number of customer types where it's not the ideal solution. So whenever you're looking at smart ticketing in the round or so, uh, ways of smarter ticketing, it's not, there's no one type of smart ticketing that, that really covers all the customer journey types. So it's about um, the customer being able to choose the type of ticket or the type of token or the, the method of fulfillment that suits them best and then using that for travel. So yes, if, you, um, you know, if you've got your bank card and that works for you and you, you don't have to go to a train company to get that because you've got it automatically, then fair enough. But if you're somebody that doesn't have a bank card and you're part of the unbanked, then maybe it's a smarter ticket that you get at the station, but it still allows you access to the level of information and the same, a similar customer experience and proposition that other people will, will, will get. So it's about providing that range which uh, suits a number of different needs. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Uh, we'll take this gentleman. Thank you, yes. Uh, my name is Stephen Waring, and I'm from Halifax. Um, and, uh, oh, thank you. Um, if you insist, I'll use it. Um, uh, my name's Stephen Waring, and I'm from Halifax. Uh, and can I say first, I think this has been a really interesting session, most interesting session of the day that I've been to, in fact. 
Um, a, a year or so ago, a few years ago, the question might have been, when are we all going to stop reinventing the wheel? Because I think, you know, we've seen lots of attempts at smart ticketing systems, smart cards, this, that and the other, different brands, different looking technology, or even if it's all the same underneath. Uh, and thought, you, you know, this is ridiculous. But at least now the positive thing is that in, here in the north we've got transport for the north trying to produce a unified system. So I think that is really, really positive. And I can see that it's really complex as well in the north. Um, I, I mean, I go to London quite a lot. I use my Oyster card. If we get the Oyster card, I use the contactless bank card. Uh, I think some people have concerns about getting the bank cards out all the time, continually. Um, but so I, my preference is the Oyster card. So I get on the bus and I touch in and it's instant. Absolutely recognises instantly. Now that's easy, of course, because it's a flat fare system in London. But also the system is very, very quick. And you notice that uh, with the um, uh, with the touch in, touch out on the underground as well. Up here, live in West Yorkshire, not so much now because I'm retired, but I used to use a pink M card quite a lot. Um, uh, it's slower. It doesn't react as quickly. Um, but now we're starting to see um, bank cards accepted on the buses, uh, some but not all. My local bus operator tells me they'll be getting them in a few months' time. I can already use them on first. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously you've got to state your destination and you go up and you put your card there and the conductor says, hang on a minute, you've got to wait till I tell you to put it there. No, no, don't put it there, put it there. And then you get on a different bus and you put it in a slightly different place. So it's confusing, you know. And uh, meanwhile, of course, we've got this business of uh, uh, you, uh, you don't know what you're gonna pay if you get on a bus. Actually, you know, that's a national scandal. And if the government will let you, and I suspect some people in the government who are quite happy for things to go on as they are, you really ought to be able to, as, as transport for the north, to stop bus operators doing that. So I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, can we not uh, have knock heads together, get the uh, bus operators and the rail operators, because there's different smart cards on different rail companies now, all working together with one system. Let's have an integrated transport system. That's what people want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> um, th thank you for your comments. And um, we're certainly tr uh, working to achieve that, improving the information. There's the bus services uh, act, which is helping us uh, and helping to put um, regulation on bus companies to provide uh, fares information which will then make available in open data as part of the programme. Um, so we're absolutely working uh, to deliver that transparency for the customer. You, you're right though, um, I think bus operators should be far more honest in, in doing that and, and some of them do. Some of them do actually post the, the fares on their websites. Um, so. Um, I, th I think it's it's collaborative. I think it's, and I, I use the term evolutionary, because this is transformation, because it's uh, a change project for me, most of this, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and that's not necessarily the technology. I think some of the technology now is, is kind of pretty much there. Um, but people's behavior and, and, and I'm talking organizations, have to change their way of thinking. And that, that takes a little bit longer. Um, but, but there is movement. I think we've got momentum now. I think uh, the customer is finally being taken seriously and um, everyone's working in, in a consistent direction. Um, we'll, we'll have to do some course corrections, I'm sure, but, but it feels like collectively we're all trying to achieve the right thing. Yeah, I mean, what, what you asked for is an integrated public transport system, and I think that's what Transport for the North are aiming to deliver with their strategic plan. And when it comes to the rest of the real delivery group, and in fact, real nationally, it's working to deliver that, that sort of single customer proposition and to, to help that. So, yeah, I think that's what you're going to get in the end, which is quite nice. I, and I can just quickly say, I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, but, but I mean, I, I'd say even simpler. People just want to get on a bus, a, a train, and go where they want to get to, and know they're not being ripped off yeah. easily. That's what they yeah. want. And all you clever people who know about transport, you can worry about how it works, but just let That's small businesses and people get on the bus, get on the train and go where they want to go. Yeah.
You do the thinking. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're here for. <laughs> Thank you to... Thank you to everybody for your contributions. Um, they're very much appreciated. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody for your contributions today. It's very much appreciated. Can we have a show of appreciation for our panel members? Thank you, thank you very much.